Councillor Sam Arif, thank you so much for joining us today at She Speaks We Here for an interview, just to get to know you a little. As you know, She Speaks We Here is a platform that loves to amplify the voices of women of colour and women of a Muslim background and heritage. So today I've just got a few questions here just to get to know you a little bit more and I hope that's okay and we will get right into it. Yeah, well, first of all, Sarah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I absolutely love the work that she speaks we here do so genuinely um honestly it's a pleasure to be here with you so thank you for having me and thank you for being here it's always always nice to just connect with women who are in influential positions especially in politics it really really you know sets a great example as a model for inspiration so on that note i will ask you do tell us a little bit about your background and about yourself because i do know that at 29 years old, you became one of the youngest councillors in Leeds, in your city, and you are a cabinet member for public health, you are part of Joe Cox Women, and you're a co-chair for Nisa Nishap, Nashim, hopefully I pronounced that right. Um, so do. in your own words, tell us. So where my political journey began? Um, a little bit about yourself just before we get into that. Oh, sure. For a bit, a bit about me. Okay, so yeah, I am a Leeds-born and bred um, British-Pakistani Muslim. I, I, I was educated. Um, I've got a law degree in Huddersfield, so I've always sort of stuck around in West Yorkshire. My background um, before I came into politics was in the in the legal field. And um, yeah, really, that's, that's sort of it. I mean, I, I do lots of different things. Um, I do politics, but I also feel it's important to do some interfaith work as well, connecting communities, because ultimately at the heart of everything we do and as politicians is to make sure that the communities are thriving and communities talk to each other. Uh, and, and if there's any barriers, we break those barriers. So I'm very, very much, aside from my political career, I'm very much um, passionate about interfaith work. Um, and that's something that I've sort of been doing for the last five years. So on that note, the next question I'm going to ask you is more about your political journey and what inspired you, because I did also read um, that your grandfathers were one of the first people to settle in Leeds and yeah. helped the immigrant community quite a bit. So, I mean, I just felt like I needed to put that in because it's such a lovely sort of like background that was given. But again, in your own words. Yeah, thank you, Cyrus. So, yes, my grandparents um, immigrated from Kashmir uh, in Pakistan, Azad Kashmir, um, were actually one of the pioneers uh, in the sense that they were the first settlers uh, from London and then they came to Leeds. Um, and, you know, they came at a time where, it, you know, the United Kingdom was a very foreign land for them. My grandparents, uh, to a, a, a big extent, sort of helped the rest of the community settle in Leeds and surrounding areas. So I guess really, whilst they weren't in politics, um, the, the, the influence of growing up in a family where you're taught to um, help your community was very, very much sort of in the forefront. In fact, I meet, I meet an elderly man rang me up about last weekend, I think 90 years old, and he rang me and I, I've only met him a couple of times and he, he somehow managed to get hold of my number and he said, oh look, I'm not surprised, you know, you're a cabinet member. He rang me to congratulate me because he said, your grandparents did this and they did this at a time where you know it was so difficult for them to do and they just did it they weren't educated people they just helped the community and and it was quite nice for me to be reminded of that because ultimately you know it's sort of where my roots are and um i suppose hopefully in some tiny way i'm making my grandparents sort of feel proud of, of me um but going back to your original question Syrah, in terms of how i came about in politics so as i've just alluded to my family's not in politics um you know it, it it wasn't a case of oh i was always going to go into politics because my father was in politics or you know anybody in my family nobody was into politics um however um my interest in sort of politics grew um in university um because when i when you go into university you start sort of questioning things and you start to think about who is it that I'm going to align myself with politically? Um, so I, I, I had that sort of conversation with myself. And it really, honestly, it was a bit of a no brainer for me to gravitate towards the Labour Party. And I'll tell you why, Syrah, because when I was younger, um, I was nine years old and unfortunately we lost my dad um, at a very young age. Um, so my mom was a widow of five young children. 
And we basically, I grew up in the Tony Blair era and I was lucky because I, mum obviously had access to, you know, we were brought up on the welfare state. Um, I went to, I had free school meals. I went to college because I had the education maintenance allowance, the EMA, which is no longer there. Um, I, I was um, able to go to university, not worrying about paying 9,000 pound fees. So it was always like, well, yeah, my mum always sort of, she has this saying, and she doesn't say it that often now, but she used to say, oh, you were, kids were bought up because of the Labour Party. Uh, the Labour, Labour government bought you kids up. And it was always like, well, the obvious choice for me is always going to be Labour. So I joined the Labour Party, but that was it. I was not involved yeah. in any activism. I was not involved in active roles. It was just, I was a card carrying member, literally. So I had a, a card that said Labour and that was it. And I, and I took interest in sort of what was going on in national politics. I didn't really take much interest in local politics. Um, the reason for that was because I just felt that it was really male dominated and I couldn't really, I couldn't, um, I didn't find myself at home in that crowd. I. I it just wasn't something that I felt any uh, affinity towards in that particular time. So I was just cracking on as a young, early 20 year old at university. Um, and then I, I was told of, you know, I got an email to say that actually our current member of parliament, he was a gentleman called George Moody, was retiring from, from East Leeds, which is the area I, I grew up in and, and where I live even now. And actually now what we need to do is go through a process of selecting and nominating a new member of parliament that's going to represent East Leeds. So Sarah, I thought, well, OK, I need to go to this meeting because this person is going to represent me, my family, my fr friends in, in national politics. So it's really important that I, I get myself to that meeting, have a look at who the members are, who the candidates are and, and vote accordingly. So I remember walking into this big building um, because obviously we were sent details about yeah. where the selection process is going to happen. So I walk into this meeting, a little bit scared because I've never attended any other Labour Party meeting, really didn't expect much, just thought I'd walk in and I'll... First just meeting. First meeting. First, meeting, first meeting, walk in, you know, quite naive, thinking, let's see where this goes. And it was, I think I remember it was one evening after college, after university. So I walk in and... Um, I walk in and I, I can picture that particular room. Um, there were 74 people in that room and out of 74 people, because I know 74 people because they did a count of who was eligible to vote. So it's always okay. stuck with me, that number. And out of those 40, 74 people, there were three women and I was one of the women. Um, wow. And I remember sitting in front um, because it was all of it was sort of, all the men were sort of sat uh, and I came on kind of really, slowly sat and sat at the front and I think that was a turning point you know in life you have moments that sort of yeah change trajectory Syrah so for me that was the moment of okay uh, yeah this these people they were really nice they were lovely people yeah. they didn't feel uncomfortable in any way but it was overwhelmingly male and I went home that night and I thought well I need to I need to you know, do something about it because I'm part of the problem by not being involved. And I'm sure there were pl plenty of other women who felt the same. Um, and then um, sort of that happened. And I, I, I got an, an invite from the then local councillor, who's my ward colleague. Obviously he saw me sort of be there and he said, look, would you be interested in, in, in getting more involved? And I said, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, went into the local labour meeting, the branch level meeting, and I became, I became the chair very quickly. Um, I think they were just probably excited to see a younger person and a woman there, to be fair. They were quite welcoming. There were some individuals who weren't always necessarily welcoming. But you were the game changer that they needed, probably. So that's that's what they, everyone was really excited about. That, Siren, and I don't know, I joke about this because it's a bit of a laugh. Um, I said that or the fact that they thought I was going to make them tease and, and make all the notes. Uh, for well, them. okay, yeah, that's the other yeah. side of politics. We no, were discussing no, I'm, I'm at, during this interview. It is a joke. No, I always, it's a joke. Um, in in the sense that you know, perhaps some perce people perceive me that way, uh, being a woman, and ordinarily, you know, you'd have a woman who's a secretary. So I became a chair, and that really began my journey of politics. Because what I did very quickly after that was, um, I started to get involved. 
um, I got involved on, on obviously on a branch level, I got involved on a slightly bigger level, which was a CLP level. Yeah. And I started to attend meetings. Um, and then people started to look at me thinking, who's this girl? Who's she? She's turning up, she's sitting with us, she's talking about things, you know, and yeah, that's where it all started for me. That, that's that's a, quite an impressive, like, sort of, like, introduction into your political career as well. Because <laughs> what I wanted to ask was that you did not particularly grow up in a political family, so there wasn't anyone who was guiding you or, you know, generally people come from families sometimes where politics is discussed in the household. It was completely your own sort of initiative to find your yes. way in politics. It was, it was, and actually not many people know this it was but there there was a bit of an element of somebody telling me to vote for somebody in that particular okay, constitution yes. and that person or that individual contacted parts of my family member to say or oh, ask Salma to vote for a particular candidate and I was like I am not having any of this no this is not the democratic me. process <laughs> No, it isn't, but it just, it showed you what was going on. And, you know, it was almost like this individual uh, expected me to roll over and say, yeah, sure, I'll vote for who you want me to vote for. And I took a stance and I said, I'm a woman and I'm a woman who's got her own vote and I will make the decision as to who I feel is the best person that will represent me. Um, and it was kind of out of defiance a little bit because I was like, well, you're not going to tell me or dictate who I vote for. Um, and actually, my family were just wonderful. Um, they were like, Sal, do what you need to do. Vote for who you feel you want to vote for, you know, despite phone calls coming in to say, tell Salma to vote a certain way. So I think there was an element of, you can't tell me what to do. I will do what I want to do, uh, you know. And, and, and th there was that defiance. And that also opened my eyes, Syrah, because it showed how the political worked, world worked locally. And I wanted yep. to change that. Nobody should, everybody should vote whoever they want to vote for. Don't get me wrong, you know, you can get lobbied, that's fine. But, you know, when you got family involved, then it just got a little bit uncomfortable for me. So, yeah, no, no background. Um, it just a bit of an accident, I think, my political journey was, to be fair. Uh, and, and do you know what? And then after I got involved in politics, people came up to me and said, why don't you represent us? You're young, you live in the area. So yeah. I lived in here. I was born in the area you understand the issues you're articulate we would love for you to be a counsellor and you know when, when a couple of people said the word counsellor I am not going to lie to you as a young woman I felt like oh no surely I can't be a counsellor it's just way out of my league you know you have to be a certain way to be a counsellor you need to be you know and I was just I had that imposter syndrome I don't like that word but I did at oh, okay. that point um, have the or oh, I'm not what did enough. you think it entailed just if, if I could ask because you're okay. saying that, that, that I, you know, it was out of my league, you have to be a certain way. What did you think in your mind that it... I, I, what it entailed, honestly, at that point, at the very beginning, I, I didn't have a clue. Okay. Um, I just knew it was an important role. I knew that, you know, um, the councillor represented me and my views in local government. And my vote was really, really precious. And who I voted for mattered. I was yes. very um, precious of my vote. I, I knew that because obviously I grew, you know, I, I studied law at university. Yes. And I was, yeah, I was keen in terms of what was going on in the rest of the country in terms of politically. So I was politically aware. Um, but in terms of what, you know, you can never really know until you become a counsellor to actually fully appreciate what it is. But I did know that it was about justice. I did know about the fact that it was about whoever, reps, if you become a counsellor, you, you have to stand up for your constituents. You have to make life easier. There's yeah. issues that you have to go and resolve. And I felt as though, oh no, surely that can't be me. Um, but actually the more I got involved, um, the more I thought, actually, do you know what? I could possibly do this and let's see if it happens. So in 2015, I got selected to run or run for the seat for the election in 2016 for the Hare Hills and Gipton Ward. And I lived in, I was born in Hare Hills, yeah. new area all my life. Um, and then I got, I had an election in 2016 and I got 79% of the vote, which was massive, obviously, but it was a strong Labour health seat. So I'm not going to take the full credit of that, but it was just good to know that. Oh, go on. You can take the full credit of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you've got to be honest. If I was a man, I'd probably take all the credit, but oh, um, no, <laughs> you know, I am not a good, successful campaign. And I think but it put pressure on me, Syra, of the fact that 79% of the people in this area have voted for you. Therefore, you have to 
meet expectations. So I always walked in not taking for granted the votes that I had, but yeah. the opposite of there's a massive responsibility on my shoulders and I need to get this right. No, absolutely. There, I, I can't even imagine that being in your position, there's that constant um, feeling that you have to deliver on the promises that you make to the people that elected you. And that, I mean, that is a huge responsibility because we know how, you know, turbulent politics can be as well. So, no, I mean, I, that, that, that's really, really very, very impressive. You know, I'm sitting here interviewing you and I'm just listening to everything you're saying. And I'm just thinking, wow, that is so many accomplishments. Like, you know, that's grit and determination right there. And on that note, I'm going to ask the next question, which, you know, it's something that you mentioned. I wanted to ask, as a BAME woman, um, mm -hmm. how would you summarize your experience of being in the Labour Party so far? And I ask this because we know that, you know, gender politics is at the forefront of a lot of the political discourse that, you know, yeah. we face. And especially people like you who are actually in positions of power as a councillor. So I just wanted to hear your view on that. You know, that's a really, really important question because there are other BAME women that I, I meet um, or have met in my journey and there is a reluctance of getting involved in politics because of literally the barriers that you've just mentioned. I have obviously have had my fair share, but honestly, I, I'm, I don't want to sit here and pretend to be something or a victim when that wasn't the case. I've had, a, I think, a fairly plain sailing political career in in in, in quite a, a few respects my part my experience of the Labour Party has been really positive I was almost like I've I, I think from day dot it felt like people had their arm around me um, I was seen as a young British Asian Muslim woman and I think that was a positive with that was yeah. within the city anyway um so they saw me as somebody who who needs support somebody who needs encouragement i never felt from the within the labor party that oh what are you doing here you shouldn't have a space here if anything it was the opposite um i was elected in 2014 um 16 sorry in that same year joe cox sadly passed away yes. and we had i i managed to get on to the um joe cox leadership program which was run by the labor party and that was just absolutely instrumental for me it was a one year long co leadership wow. course and i met 55 other women across the whole of the country and we were like a sisterhood and that trained me about how you go about conducting interviews what the political life works like how as a woman you need to be confident certain skill sets that i took on from that course and more importantly i had a 50 other women surrounding me and in, in my corner so my, I was quite lucky that I had that support because of the Joe Cox program yeah and that kind of really really helped me in terms of building my confidence um so my my experience of of, of the Labour Party I love the Labour Party you know I my my life to a lot of it I owe what I am because of the Labour Party um at the same time I I and obviously I understand we haven't been in the since my course as a counsellor um, we haven't been in power and I will do what I can in my power to bring back a Labour government because I so desperately understand how important it is to have a Labour Party. Um, but within the in sort of politics of the Labour Party and as a BAME woman, there have been individuals who have perhaps been awkward with me or, you know, I've had instances, instances but that's not because yeah. it, it's, it's an individual, not the Labour Party. Uh, but so I've 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 had nothing but encouragement, and I'd, and as you've said, even within the Labour group in Leeds, you know, four and a half years in, and I'm now a cabinet member, and I've I've held some really important roles. I was a deputy exec member for families and and children. So you know, diversity is very much recognised in Leeds City Council, and we had a just she's left as now a Baroness Judith Blake. She is now she was the woman leader. You know, she had. Over fifty percent at one point of her cabinet was women. So wow. you know, I'm yeah. I compared to the rest of the the, the country, you know, Leeds is absolutely brilliant. And um, so I, I've got I've got no no faults or complaints. Having said that, you know, we have to continue with this work. I have a responsibility, Syra, to ensure that I put the ladder down for other women of colour or non-colour um, to to come up to support them because to some extent I had a lot of people putting their hand down to me so it's important that I carry on with that as well 
No, I mean, that is really positive to hear. And I specifically wanted to ask that question because, I mean, as we know, politics is, is very, very turbulent as well. And there's a lot of people on the fence and we have important elections coming. So especially for women of, of color or those who yeah. are unsure whether they belong in politics or whether they should participate, you know, this words like that could just be the difference between them doing so. So I always, always want to ask anybody, especially women in politics, uh, mm. questions like this. So because they can, you know, set a great example and create a pathway for others as well. Um, so what I wanted to ask next was that on the back of that and being in position of power, what are some of the greatest highs and some lows that you've experienced so far? And when I say that, it can be anything. It can be, you know, things that you've loved so far, things that you haven't, you know, the behind the scenes, just anything that you want to divulge. Yeah, so Saira, just following on from your final point as well about, you know, we've always wanted to know what it was like sort of in, 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 and encourage other women and hopefully that will, my words will help other women to come forward. The only piece of advice I will say, politics is an incredibly tough place to be in you have to walk in with a, an, almost a shield of armor um and and actually the shield of armor could be having two three other women as your allies and um, i made allies very quickly and as joe cops being one of them so it's yes. important that you're not alone in this political journey it's important that you do have allies and they don't necessarily have to be women but i had a lot of men that were my allies um, yes. because it, it can be a turbulent place politics can and there will be a lot of people and they questioned me and why I was here and what I was doing and you know the, the, the issue I had was my expectations of people because I represent a quite a diverse community you know the expectations of me are really quite high of yes. being you know i.e somebody would ring you at 11 p.m and the expectation is that i would answer the phone call so okay. just to, <laughs> that's, that's just the life of a counselor yes. um, to some extent so you know that being a color, color a woman of color there is definitely in, in a community that is very diverse i definitely feel as though there are more complications or more um, expectations so just a, just a warning i mean it, it has been a good journey for me but there have been times where it has been difficult and you just have to navigate your way through that and to do that is you need to make sure you've got strong allies men and women and um, so that's just a final point on the previous question and your previous comments coming on to my highs and lows oh god where do I start um, <laughs> I was like I was like that's probably going to be yeah a question which is going to get you thinking because you've probably had a lot of both you're absolutely do you know what Cyber? highs and lows happen within a day I can have a really good morning and then I can have a really bad afternoon, depending on what's happened. That is just how politics is. It's just depending on what is going on. God forbid, you know, in the area you represent, you know, I've had some awful sort of instant incidents where a young boy got killed um, that belonged in my um, in my my community. Um, That's awful. Like a young lady, uh, a mum of five was murdered by her husband. You know, oh they are the real, yeah, they, these are the things that you have to deal with as a, as a counselor. And, and they really, and then you think to yourself on a personal level, could I have done anything to, to stop that? Um, could, what can I do now to prevent that? So there so are your sort of lows. But on a personal level, I'll start with my low. I put myself forward um, to stand as a parliamentary candidate for a local seat that came up in um, 2018, it is now. 2018 2019 so much so many general elections have happened yeah. and, and I, I put myself forward and that was such an, a grueling exercise for me as as a, I can't as even a imagine woman. yeah honestly like I thought being counselor putting myself forward as a PPS um you know it, it really was a grueling process because you have to go out put yourself out there ask for votes you need to think about the financial aspect of producing leaflets you know and and that and obviously I, I I did lose I didn't I wasn't successful in that um you know that endeavor, but actually in hindsight everything happens for a reason, um you know p perhaps for me that it wasn't the right time um but I did put myself forward and actually whilst it was a really really difficult time for me and a stressful time for me to put myself out there I learned probably more losing than I would have done winning that seat or that okay. that particular. Yeah, so that, that was, a I would say, a low, but actually a low that I learned a lot from. And um, one of the highs that I'm really, really proud of 
So Sarah, why do we go into politics? Because you want to help people, you want to make a difference. And I walked into the Leeds City Council thinking that's exactly what I was going to do. And which, you know, touch what I, I do on a daily basis. But sometimes the speed of things can be frustrating because you want to make a big change. But actually there's a lot of things or hoops that you have to get through for change to happen. So when I first became a councillor and I was campaigning, even before I became a councillor, the biggest thing I noticed, so I live in a, in a city ward and I represent an area that is very diverse and it's an inner city. There's a lot of poverty. The first thing I noticed or people told me there was the our high street, Syrah, had a lot of off licenses. Okay. So there were a lot of people drinking just outside that was impacting on antisocial behaviour issues. Yeah. You know, women and kids felt really uncomfortable. And I think we did a, we did some investigation and we found that 70% of our high street shops were selling alcohol. Um, so right. that, that was like, how do you even go about tackling something like this in an area like Hair Hills? Um, and I remember having a meeting with lots of different officers. So we had the police there, we had the licensing team there, we had communities team there. We had loads of people in this big room. And I said to them, look, I want to do something about the drinking issues or the off licenses that we've got in Hair Hills. And I would say 95% of those people in that room said to me, no counselor, there isn't an issue in Hair Hills. Don't worry about it, it's, it's under control. And I, I, I wanted to sit there and I, I was so upset that I wanted to cry. And I was like, I live in that area. I was born in that area. My residents are telling me we have an issue here please listen to me and, and that was a bit disappointing for me because I thought well I was going to go in and it's going to change and, and of all course, these yeah. telling me it, it's not a problem so that I remember was a difficult meeting but I persevered and I said no we're going to go down this route and we, I want you to go and do a consultation with the local residents and ask them what they think the issue is in relation to off licenses so we did a consultation process and overwhelmingly all of the residents said this is an awful issue on our doorsteps it's causing us so many anxieties it's 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 not great for children antisocial behavior issues we are absolutely sick of it so that because of that consultation process we then produced a policy uh, called the cip which is a cumulative impact policy um, it took a couple of years but eventually we passed that through full council and what that means in this area of hair hills where we've got the high streets anybody who wishes to apply for an off license a new off licenses they'd have to prove a case as to why they need another off licenses okay uh, and since that's passed we've had two or three different businesses wanting to create more off licenses and they've all been rejected so that's been a massive massive thing for me because it just means it's not what happens in one year it's what happens in 10 years yeah. if we didn't have that policy another off license would come, another off license would come, another off license would come, um, which would just make things worse and worse. And whilst don't get me wrong, we've got to deal with the issues that we've got at the moment. We've stopped to some extent the stem of more off licenses, which could have caused more issues. So that's something I'm really proud of because that's actual something that tangible that I've done in terms of policy work, but it was a journey um, and it took a couple of years before we got there. So I think that's a massive high because I look back now and I know that you know, hopefully we're going to have less issues on the streets now. A kid can doesn't have to walk by and see lots of glasses of you know, alcohol on the floor. And, and it just means they're living in a better environment. And that's my job as a counsellor. That is really wonderful. Now, what I wanted to ask was, did you at any point have resistance from anybody when you were trying to implement that policy? Resistant in the sense that did anybody try to sabotage this process? Um, or would, did you have support from the right people? That is just what something I wanted to know. So that's a good question, Saira. The support, the vast majority of support, and, and this happened because my residents stood behind me okay. um, and said, yes, Salman, we're telling you this is an issue. And I and nobody could ignore that. Nobody could ignore um, words and words of essays of why this was an issue and when that went to the licensing committee they looked at it and they said oh my god we did not realize that this was a, such a big issue in the community um, so whilst um, that first initial meeting where some of the officers or the vast majority of officers didn't recognize that this was an issue you know they just there was a bit of denial at the beginning 
but actually once they realize that you know what there's an issue here everybody kind of got behind it and then the officers put in a lot of work to get the policy through to you know full council and um, so i think it was the initial hesitation and what you need to understand Syro, is as a councillor you best understand your community especially if you've come from that community of course if you live in that community and especially when your, your residents are telling you things sometimes it's difficult to get that across to other people who may not perceive it as an issue but that's where a councillor that's where a local politician comes in because my job at the end of the day is to represent my residents and if my residents are telling me there's an issue and i can see that there's an issue i have to do what i can to make sure we do and put things in place to, to mitigate those issues um, so yeah, it's just it's just navigating time and and, and barriers um, because I would have liked for that to happen sooner than it did, but we got there in the end, and that's that's the most important thing. You did. Um, what I also wanted to ask because you know you've summarised a lot of the work that you've done um, as a counsellor um, and policies. Um, you are also known to do a lot of interfaith work as well across communities. So I just wanted you to tell us a little bit about that as well. Yeah, no, thank you for that. So there's politics uh, <laughs> that I do anyway, but I think interfaith work is more of a personal thing for me. Um, and it kind of probably seems into my politics, but I, I, I politics is, is obviously me and my residents and, and, and making changes. But I also believe that a community, for a community to thrive, it needs to get on with each other. We need to support each other, particularly minorities. We have to not look at each other suspiciously. Yeah. And it's not us or them, it should be us. Um, you know, that's so sort of, I've always kind of had that. And in 2000, and before I became a counsellor, actually, so this is pre pre counsellor, I, I was introduced uh, by a common friend who sadly is no longer with us and she passed away last year. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, she introduced me um, to a Jewish lady because she said um, this Jewish lady has approached me to say that I don't know any Muslim people and I would like to get to know a Muslim person because all I know about Jewish Muslim women or Muslim people is what I hear from the media and this was yep. on the back of the Paris attacks all right, um, so okay. I, I was really taken back and I was like wow somebody wants to meet me and because she, she wants to genuinely get to know what Muslims are about so I met um, this lady called Hillary and we went for coffee back in 2015 and she said look I don't know any Muslim people and what I do know is what I hear from from the news and I know that you guys are not all bad and you're not all terrorists and no. I'd like to extend my hand and like to get to know you and I was really taken back by that and I was like that is really sweet of you to come and, 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 and extend your hand of friendship so me and Hillary then decided that okay well why don't we create something like a group of because Jew the Jewish population in Leeds is quite big outside of London, I think, and Manchester, I think it's the third highest population. So there's a lot of Jewish people that live in the community. But I honestly couldn't say I know Jewish people or I have Jewish yeah. friends. And I knew Jewish people from school and work, but I didn't I didn't really communicate with them. And the vast majority of people in the, my area, again, looked at Jewish people suspiciously because okay. of the background of Israel and Palestine. Of course. So yeah. there was that, you know, don't trust the Jews, you know, this is what they're doing to Palestine and, you know, and vice versa. So there are sort of generalizations and stereotypes I, I, I've yeah. seen that play out in both sides of the community, unfortunately. Absolutely, 100%. So Hillary and I said, well, why don't we try doing something and bring the communities together? So we formed um, a Jewish Muslim women's group called Nisa Nashim, which not is a national group that we tagged along to and just created a Leeds version of it I think again in 2016 we did a massive launch we had about 40 50 Jewish Muslim women got a lot of press around it and we've been going for five years but that work has been really important because I've as a counsellor as a Muslim counsellor in a, in a in a community in a South Asian community I've stood up and I've said I am a Nisa Nashim co-chair and I am proud to have friends that are Jewish I've yes. been leading by, I've been, you've got to lead by example as a counselor. So some of my constituents have thought, oh, well, Salma's friends with Jewish people. That's a good thing. It can't, Jewish people can't be. So it's just, I've been trying to foster rela positive relationships with, within the Jewish and Muslim communities. And Hillary's done that on her side. And we've done lots of events. Uh, we've had picnics in the park. We've opened 
fast together. Uh, we've been involved in um, each other going each other's houses. We've done up, been to each other's synagogues and mosques, and yes, we've just created a beautiful relationship. And it, through that work, I know that there's so many Muslim women who have met Jewish women, and so many Jewish women have met Muslim women. Yes, and we've created friendships and and that's been a beautiful beautiful part of, of the Nita Nasheen journey for me because it's being able to create those relationships so that's something I do in Leeds and as part of that Nita Nasheen work I also do some other stuff where I was involved in Muslim Jewish conference which is basically an international conference where you get 50 Jewish people young youngish people and 50 Muslim people from all over the world in one room under one roof for one week um so that's we're, fantastic we're, we're in bosnia we've been in bosnia we've been in berlin we've been in france and these i mean england is slightly different because you still know there's different minorities but these are people who are let's say from somali who've never met a jewish person before and have massively pre preconceived ideas of what a jewish person is and sitting wow. in a room and talking about how we feel about each other and then going into our own communities and building on the relationships we've had so i've been involved in that for the last four three four years and um, so that's something that i absolutely that's very close to my heart as well so yeah aside from politics interfaith is important to me uh, particularly in the jewish communities because of the issues that we've got um, and the the barriers that we really need to break so that's been an important part of what i've been doing that is a fantastic summary of what you've been doing and it sounds like you're achieving a lot um it's very exciting because you know um interfaith communities is something that is always a work in progress especially in countries like britain so yeah. what i wanted to ask was are you looking to further your political aspirations yes I'm absolutely. Get to the next I'm level not, yeah. So, um, so as you know i it was announced only it's actually i've been a cabinet member for two days um, it was announced on Wednesday. It was announced a couple of weeks before, but it was official on Wednesday that I would go and be part of the cabinet for Leeds City Council. So you know what, I am absolutely so grateful to be able to be to have a position like um, being on the Leeds City Council cabinet, and particularly public health, which right now is the most immediate challenge the whole of the country faces particularly around the vaccination, yes. um, you know, public health more than ever is important because it's clearly shown a light on the inequalities of health within our communities. So for me to, to come in at this point um, is, is both terrifying and exciting and challenging at the same time. Um, and actually, you know, again, really super proud that I think I'm the first non-white woman to, to be on the Leeds City Council cabinet. So again, that's that's a big role for me. I, I guess it says less about me, but more about, you know, the leadership in the city council for them to, to, to bring me in at this very pivotal time. So my, my, um, at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have my hands totally full cyber for the next year or By so. By the sounds of it, it definitely yeah. doesn't then some more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But in terms of politically, you know what, I absolutely want to carry on doing what I want to do. And um, one day I'd absolutely love to, to be in, 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 in parliament. Um, you know, but for me, the work that I've been doing locally has been so, so crucial because I've really got to see what's what's important in local politics. So, yeah, career wise, let's see where like, you know, life is so mysterious. You don't know where it'll take you. Um, yes, I'd like to be in Parliament. I'm happy where I am at the moment. If an opportunity comes by and if I head that way, absolutely, I will take it. And I'm not shy about saying that you have to be ambitious. You have to be clear about where you want to be. And I'd love to be in Parliament one day. But right now, with the current situation, you know, I'm, I love where I am. I love being a lead city councillor. And I absolutely have a lot of work to do here. And I'm hoping to sort of steer the city with my public health hat on, um, hopefully in, in the most challenging times that we've got at the moment. And as we wrap this interview up, I would like to ask, what piece of advice would you give to anybody looking to carve out or enter politics i mean what would be the main things you would say to them if okay they <laughs> enter that field i think that i think anybody who wants to come into politics um it isn't as scary as people make it out to be i do think that it it is challenging and i do think that you have to walk in um with 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 some you know oomph and knowing that there's going to be some difficult battles to fight 
But the key thing I would say is please, please have allies around you. It can be a very lonely place, politics. And it's so important to be able to, if you've had a bad day, to pick up a phone to someone who you know you can have a rant with and who understands. Um, I've got to where I've got to and the things that I've done is because of, of the, the things that I have done. And the other thing that's really important is you, you should always continue continuously look to develop and do different courses, do the Jewish Joe Cox um, programme, don't just do politics, do other community work as well, because eventually everything that you're doing connects within itself. And I think the final piece of advice I will say to you is, is to anybody who's listening is, if we don't come to the table, yeah, we are going to be on the menu. Always remember yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah. So if if you if you're not involved, if I'm not here, people are going to be making decisions about me and what happens around my life. So if that if you if that bothers you, and you want to make decisions and you care for your community and you feel as though politically you can you can bring something to the table, come to the table. Um, but yeah, look, it's 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 a, it is a tough game here. I'm not going to lie to you, but it's so so rewarding because before I was a counsellor, I, I was in 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 the legal field. And I, I didn't feel fulfilled. You know, I was just making a rich man richer. And um, despite how bad the day can be as a counsellor, you go to sleep knowing that actually, do you know what, somewhere I did something decent. Made somewhere. an impact, made a difference. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily, it's not even the big thing. It's not, it's, it might even just be picking up the phone to a 90 year old resident who just needs to talk to you because she's not spoken to anybody for a week. Especially during these times as well. Exactly. So it's just really often the most tiniest things. And, and sometimes I kind of think as well, you know, what difference have I made? But it, over time, you do make the tiniest of difference. So my advice is just do it if you're passionate about it. Um, just know what you're getting yourself into and have allies around you. That's the most important thing. And those are, that, that, that is quite an important piece of advice as well, to have allies around you as a support group. Because I think a lot of people, and like you said, have this idea that, politics can be a very, very um, tough place and um, it can be a lonely place as well. But it's, it's, it's good that we, you know, people like you can give advice like that and smash those sort of like stereotypes. Absolutely. And do you know what? I, th I think don't be scared because if, if you're passionate about something, life just works out, you know, you, you navigate yourself through it. Um, and it, it is tough, but you know, anything worth having is tough in life. You yes. know, anything that you really want and something that's hard, it's never going to be easy. And it's, no. it's more rewarding, actually, if you put uh, put put in the time and effort and, and walk into a difficult field. In the end, you know, you, you feel more fulfilled, I think. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Councillor Samara, for your time. Um, it has been a pleasure speaking to you and hearing about your story and the work you're doing. And we are excited to see you as a young trailblazer and you don't even need to be young you just need to be a, you know someone who is smashing the glass ceiling and creating a pathway and really really you know we wish the best for you and we are going to be watching you thank you Saira I must say I've got more white hairs now that I'm a politician I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> well, you couldn't tell from this angle all I see is a beautiful mane of black hair um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and I just hope that even if one person one woman gets inspired to go into politics because of what she's heard from me you know that's my job done and just to say if anybody is looking to go into politics or is thinking about it and just needs some advice I'm here please reach out to me I'm on social media um you know that's so important for me to make sure just because of where I am I, I need to help other people as well so it's always a reminder for me and I always say if there's any support you guys need just pick up the phone or just drop me a, a message on, on Instagram Twitter whatever I'm more than happy to help well thank you so much that's a really really nice thing to say and I'm sure a lot of people will be reaching out after that thank you Saira <laughs> thank you have a good rest of your day then I will do thank you it's sunny thank out you. here thank you it's really lovely out there. Enjoy it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.